All right, Jeff. So first and foremost, how are you feeling? Very excited. This is a huge milestone for the company. There's still a lot of work to do, but this is a uh, inflection point in the history of our attempt on HIV. Walk me through May 19th and when that infusion first took place. How were you feeling that day? What was going through your mind? Walk me through it. Well, the anticipation of that uh, was just uh, tremendous, right? I mean, and there was nothing that I could do personally. It was just a matter of everything was in process and we were just hoping it would come off smoothly. So that morning, somewhere around 8.45 a.m., uh, the participant shows up and they get about three hours of tests and physicals and so forth. And once it's determined that they seem healthy and ready for the infusion, there's about 15 minutes to infuse about 100 milliliters of uh, that contains a billion HIV specific T cells that are immune to HIV. And then after that, because now the drug is in their body, essentially those cells, those modified cells are the drug they sit for four hours of observation. So it's a full day thing. Uh, this may not be necessary with the final product, uh, assuming that we get to a final product. Uh, but for now, the protocol requires all this, um, you know, all of these steps to make sure that we are assuring the safety of the patient as much as possible. This is the phase one of this clinical trial and the goal is to produce an HIV cure. That's correct. Yeah, it's the phase one, but one interesting fact, Justin, and, and I'm not sure if you're already aware of this, is that a phase one in gene and cell therapy will frequently not just get you safety data, which we are fairly certain we'll get out of this, but it can get you efficacy signal as well, even sometimes first human efficacy. So the phase one is a big deal. It's not like a traditional drug, you know, from decades ago where a phase one is just a dose escalation study and you see if it makes healthy people feel sick. Gene and cell therapies are things that can last for life in the body. And so the FDA only allows you to try these on patients that have disease because it isn't considered worth the risk to treat patients that are healthy. So as a result, you're treating people that have the disease. And so you might get some uh, additional information that wouldn't be available in traditional uh, drug studies. You said you'd follow this patient for quite some time afterwards. Uh, the first infusion happened on May 19th, so we're not that far removed from the infusion. Have you noticed anything so far, any side effects? What, what can you tell us about that? So it's important to understand that the company is never in direct contact with the patient unless there's some special arrangements made and special permissions and things like that. So, uh, so far, I'm just getting reports back through our regulatory department that are coming from the clinical head, uh, you know, the site administrator and, and the, the participant's doctor. To be, to be truthful, I don't even know if the patient is male or female. And so that's how isolated I am from it. However, the word that's come back is that the infusion could not have gone better that they did not notice anything unusual that might be considered an adverse event during the infusion day. And then there was a day one uh, requirement that the, that the uh, participant come back and get a physical checkup and also give a blood uh, sample. And there was still nothing noteworthy. So that was the best I could have possibly hoped for. And uh, again, you know, it, it just raised the excitement level uh, uh, around here. Safety is really critically important because if we prove that this process of making these modified cells and reinfusing them are within safe limits, we can then go back, even if this first attempt doesn't get a cure, we can go back and re-engineer that. And we know uh, that the basic process is safe so we can kind of debug the software in those cells and try again. And uh, we're already working on uh, even better ways uh, to improve the activity of these cells in the body. So, um, you know, the safety thing was a particularly big event for me personally, because it increased my confidence that HIV can be cured. And uh, it, you know, recommitted the whole company, including me, 
to just keep pursuing that. Talk to me a little bit about how important that really is. Do you mean how important it is to cure HIV? Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. I, that's such a great question, Justin, because I don't think many people are aware of the current situation with HIV in the world or even in the United States. So you have about 1.2 million people in the US that are infected with HIV. And only about a third of them are well controlled, uh, which means that they're taking a daily antiretroviral therapy. It's a chemotherapeutic. It basically distributes through the bloodstream and it prevents virons from moving from cell to cell to infect new cells. And by that constant suppression, what happens is, is the normal immune system returns, so they cannot get AIDS. And if they're really just absolutely fastidious about this and they can keep that viremia level below un undetectable in a standard lab, uh, lab test, it's still detectable in special lab tests. But once it goes below the levels of standard lab tests, they cannot infect another person. So you would say, a lot of people would say, okay, well, they're pretty much fine in that case, right? And, but, the, but that's not the case. First of all, there are side effects of that medication. So it's very common that they experience fatigue, uh, but also nausea and diarrhea. Uh, you might say, well, that's just an inconvenience. But then long-term exposure can cause early aging, bone density issues, osteoporosis, brittle bones, liver, kidney, heart disease, and extra cancers. So the issue with these patients are they're very expensive to maintain. The medication may be twenty to thirty thousand dollars worth of medication per year, but then the doctor's visits to treat the comorbidities of the low-grade infection and this antiretroviral therapy side effects could be fifty to eighty thousand dollars a year. So they're very expensive to maintain. And then going back to that population, two-thirds of people in the United States aren't even taking their meds, so they're still contagious. So it's actually still an epidemic that's 30 to 50,000 new cases a year and about 30 to 50,000 deaths per year that are attributable to HIV. So there's a lot of suffering going on in that population. And when I talk to HIV infected individuals, what I hear from them is the physical pain isn't even the worst part. The worst part is the isolation. It's the mental, um, you know, sort of stress of feeling like an outsider, feeling uh, you know isolated, feeling misunderstood, fearing that even you know the uh, people around them might find out that they're HIV positive, even if they are completely well controlled and absolutely no threat to anybody, they still live with that fear that they have something that nobody would accept around them. And if you can imagine, you know how painful that could be. Uh, you know, you, you have behaviors and things like that. You change your behavior because you've got it, because you're being cautious. You don't want to infect anybody else. And, you know, so you're doing these different things and people don't understand why. Or you're tired. You used to be the life of the party and now you're not. Or you were a party animal and now you're not. And you used to go out drinking with your buddies every Friday night and now you're not, right? I mean, it's, it really is like, it's a life changing thing for these folks. So a cure is absolutely essential to bring them back to a normal quality of life. And that's what we are trying to do here at AGT. What we want to make is a one and done therapy where once the therapy is in the body and it has time to what's called in grafts, and it might take a couple of weeks, the patient would be able to throw away their antiretrovirals. So they're not taking any pills that somebody might see in their bag as they're going through security at the airport or on their counter if somebody visits them at the house or whatever, right? They're not getting the side effects of any of that stuff. And yet their body now can naturally control the viremia at levels where it, it meets that undetectable uh, level of, you know, below the level of a normal lab test. So what does that mean? They can never get AIDS. They can never infect another person. And because they're own immune system is controlling the virus and possibly even eliminating the virus, it, uh, they can never be reinfected. So it's like a, it has so almost like a vaccine effect on top of a curative effect. Now think about how that would feel to an HIV infected individual. Science, medicine, and the industry converted HIV, you know, back in the 80s from a death sentence 
to a life sentence of taking antiretroviral therapy to suppress the virus. We may have a get out of jail car free card. And that is really what this project is all about. That is what we are shooting for. That's what we are committed to working towards. And it's been a while since we last talked about this process. So walk me through it one more time, how exactly it works. Sure. So when somebody's well controlled on antiretroviral therapy, you probably know already just from sort of common knowledge that they're no longer in danger of catching a cold and dying from the cold, like it won't turn into pneumonia. Their, their normal ability to fight colds and flus and bacterias and funguses and things like that comes back. And the reason for that is by suppressing the virus, the cells that are infected die off and your bone marrow produces new fresh cells. And because you're suppressing the virus, they don't get infected. So they start carrying out their normal activity in the body. Uh, now, during that same phase of getting well controlled, you actually get HIV fighting T cells back. Now you had them your whole life. You and I, doesn't matter whether we've ever been exposed to HIV, we have HIV specific CD4 positive T cells that are, that are evolved to detect HIV pathogen in the body and attack it, right? The only problem is, is that HIV virons have evolved the capability of infecting that T cell. So it actually is the first, it's the target of HIV. So that initial sentinel T cell, it's supposed to clear your body and start a whole immune cascade, gets infected instead and starts spreading it around your body. So that's what we're doing is we're gonna re-engineer those cells so that they can't be infected. And what happens if they can't be infected? Well, then they can do their normal job. They can clear HIV like your cold T cells clear a cold or your flu T cells clear the flu. So that is the objective of this. And there is a lot of scientific evidence that that theory holds, the Berlin patient, the London patient, the Singamo study, so there are numerous people out there that are functionally cured. Don't take ART and the virus is suppressed and they're living a normal life. Here's our process. Once you're well controlled, we take a 400 milliliter Leuka pack of blood. Leuka packs are filtered for uh, white blood cells. So we're getting a high concentration of T cells. These T cells could be for anything, but a very small percentage of them are for HIV. And we put it into an automated cell processing machine that's a benchtop unit that could go anywhere in the world, doesn't even need a clean room. So any clinic could buy one of these things. You hang the bag of, of the leukopheresis bag on there and a bunch of reagents. And this machine automatically sorts out the HIV T cells and then it modifies them with our proprietary lentiviral vector to be immune to HIV. And then we culture them up to a billion of those cells. So when we reinfuse the patient, we're giving him back his or her own T cells, cultured up so there's more of them, but they're the T cells that came from that person's body, totally compatible. And the only difference between a normal HIV T cell and the ones we're putting back in is that we have made tiny little modifications that make them impermeable to HIV. So at a billion cells, that's about 10 times the normal number of these cells that you have when you clear a viral pathogen. So when you clear a cold, you'll have 100 million cells uh, of cold type. If you clear a flu, you'll have 100 million of those. So we thought, okay, 10X that is probably a good margin above what you'll probably need. And that's the theory that we're testing in this first phase one. So it goes back into the patient. They will take a little bit of time to recover. So uh, we believe there would have to be some wait before somebody could go off their antiretrovirals, but it's probably just a week or two, or maybe even less. I'm not, I'm not an expert on that. So I'll leave that to the scientists and the, and the medical doctors. But at some point, they can discontinue their antiretroviral therapy. So what will happen is cells in their body that still have the HIV genome in them will start producing virons that'll get into the bloodstream. And we think these cells will detect them and start an entire normal immune cascade um, to control that virus and eliminate it. So what should happen is the CD4 positive T cells will come over and find the HIV viron, and instead of being infected, they'll attack and kill it, and they'll actually multiply up to whatever number the patient needs to fight the level of virus 
in the body, which we think will be less than the initial number. But here's what's great about this is that the CD4 cells will actually create a CD8 reaction in the body. And CD8s don't get infected directly by HIV. So uh, the CD8 response will clear up all of the mutations. And it also triggers through the dendritic cells an antibody response. So these patients will develop antibodies against the HIV virus. So keep your fingers crossed. You know, if the theory holds and if we've hit the right numbers on this thing, uh, you know, the, we believe that this is a great shot on goal for a potential HIV functional cure. And if you don't mind, I'll just explain what the word functional means. Think of it as as good as, right? So there may still be tiny bits of HIV in somebody's body, but it won't matter. So that's the idea, equivalent to functional, equivalent to a cure, not technically a total cure, although we haven't ruled out that these cells might clear the body entirely of all HIV. Wow. Um, listening to you explain that, part of me is going, that sounds really expensive. <laughs> Have you gotten to that point to figure out what cost would be, or are we still too early in that process? Well, the question will be who will price it, right? Because we're not exactly sure what will happen with the project. Will we commercialize it? Will we partner with a pharma company? Will we sell off the project to a pharma company? You know, the all that stuff is not yet determined. But here's what I can tell you, which I think is very exciting. When I look at the economics, the pharma company that owns this, whether it's us or somebody else, will make more money off of every HIV patient than they are right now. So they won't have an incentive to you know, charge more uh, than what I have sort of in mind. And yet that number- Which is? If, you know, I hate to say this, but I think that maybe somewhere around, it could be done somewhere around $500,000 per patient. Now okay. you go, well, that's a lot, right? It's only $20,000 to control the, the virus on the cheapest antiretroviral meds that are available in the United States. But you're neglecting the fifty dollars to $80,000 worth of doctor's visits for side effects, right? So even if antiretrovirals were free, it wouldn't matter. The insurance companies would be spending two to $3 million in the lifetime of the patient. Okay. They're I spending have to ask. Up, Continue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so I think that's the point is that the, the pharma companies can make plenty of profit on this while still reducing the overall cost of, uh, uh, of managing HIV patients for the insurance company. So the insurance companies ought to like it. The pharma companies ought not to be threatened by it, right? And, you know, so there's, there's value in that for all of the profit-oriented industries surrounding this. But then think about the benefit to the patient, right? The, the enemy within is vanquished forever. Could you imagine if you had a contagious cancer, what you would feel like, right? If you, you know, knew that there was some possibility of your cancer jumping from your body to somebody else's and the only way you could control it is with a pill that made you feel sick every single day, right? You know, that's, it's different, right? I'm not trying to, you know, somehow equilibrate those two things. But, but that's the basic idea is that we could return those patients to a normal life where they know they're no different than anybody else. They have no pill to take. They are no threat to anybody around them. They have no uh, possibility of developing AIDS. And then they even have a, a potential benefit, which is they can't be reinfected. So if they're in a community where HIV is prevalent, they still don't have to worry about it. So think about, you know, from having that sort of, you know, monster within you to never thinking about it again. Think about the, the relief that that would feel and the quality of life issues with, you know, getting rid of the nausea, the diarrhea, the fatigue, you know, the, the problems with liver and kidney and heart disease and potential, you know, reducing the chances of cancers. I mean, this is a tremendous benefit, obviously, to the patients. That's why we're so committed to this. And we think it, it can work not just in terms of scientifically, but we think economically, this makes total sense. And now I'm gonna, do you mind if I anticipate the next question out of your mind, which is what about non-insured uh, patients? That was going to be up right? there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> because the, the nature of gene and cell therapy is very much like the nature of the computer market. 
it doubles in capability every year and it halves in cost, right? That's called Moore's law in the computer industry. And if you wouldn't mind, let's call it Galvin's law that this will be even, you know, uh, the, the uh, slope upwards. It might be four times better every year and it might be one fourth the cost. It's better than computers because I used to be in computers. So that the, the costs, the value is going, going to go way up and the costs are going to come down. And it's really competitive because the cost to develop things is much lower than the typical $2 billion traditional drug, right? So this is going to start a massive amount of competition in the industry, and there'll be multiple solutions to the same problem, just why, the way that there are multiple pieces of software that do the same thing on your computer, and you can decide which one to buy. And what does that do? It puts pressure on the companies to keep the prices reasonable. If Microsoft were to start charging $10,000 for Excel, you'd move to Google Docs, right? Or Linux. So they, even the, the number one software company in the world has to be fair with its customers, right? I think that this is a uh, beneficial revolution for everyone. I don't think any pharma company would mind being as big as Microsoft, right? I mean, Microsoft is bigger than most pharma companies. And, and that's the reality of this. Pharma companies can start looking at building more value as opposed to charging more for existing value. So you can see that I think this is beneficial to everybody. So then you go, well, what about uninsured people? Well, in the United States, if we, you know, continue to have uh, ACA and stuff like that, you know, people will be insured. And, and remember, the cost of maintaining it for uh, that patient for society is cheaper than not curing that patient. So it's always good in the United States where we have money to do that. But what about Africa? Well, if this trend continues, one day, this, you know, maybe $500,000 process might just be a shot in the arm that we can deliver for a thousand bucks. Right now they're spending $120 per year on antiretroviral therapy per person per year in sub-Saharan Africa to control the viremia because that's a global issue, right? And that's why, you know, many countries have gotten together and just paid for it out of their own pocket. Well, one day <laughs> curing them may be cheaper and more reliable than treating them for life. And, you know, in the same way that Africans are carrying cell phones today that are 40,000 times more powerful than the first Macintosh that they would have had no hopes of having the money to buy, right? Because the value went up so high and the cost was moderated, they're going to get gene and cell therapies too. And I think that's a very important aspect of the upcoming revolution in pharmaceuticals that I believe we will all experience. Yeah. So phase one now, how long does that last? Do you know how many uh, patients will be a part of that? And then what happens next? So we have an initial first part of the phase one, which is six patients. All six volunteers have signed up. We've actually made six products. So we've done that, that blood draw from all six patients. It's been through that automated cell protocol, and we are sitting with a blood product that we think is potentially curative for each one of those six patients, six participants. The first participant has been reinfused. We have five more to go on that, and that will complete a sort of first phase of the phase one that will give us some indication of safety, and then we're going to enroll another 12 patients. Uh, we've already started doing that on a new, uh, slightly different protocol uh, where we can start to hone in more on the efficacy of this. Um, it's called an uh, analytic treatment interruption. So remember I told you that if the patient were to throw away or stop taking their antiretroviral meds, right, they shouldn't rebound. They shouldn't, their virus shouldn't go up. Right. And if the virus doesn't go up, that's a great indication that the therapy is working. And then it's just a matter of how durable it is. And we would have to, you know, continue to test to see that. But um, the NIH has shown that when an HIV-infected individual goes off their antiretrovirals temporarily, and if their virus rebounds and they go back on it, there isn't a long-term consequence of that treatment interruption. So we believe that at some point it will be safe or considered safe to ask those patients to stop their medication so we can see for sure what kind of efficacy signal we can get out of this data. Well, good luck. Hopefully it continues to go well and um, you're making some, some major changes for a lot of people. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me on your show.